All right, go ahead and get started. Uh, this is using Nagios as a security tool. A uh, little disclaimer, first off, uh, in your programs, it says I work at a community bank. That's uh, actually no longer the case. I'm uh, back to doing penetration testing. Um, for those that don't know what that is, basically a company hires us, come in, do a security assessment, penetration test, and then we develop a report and kind of show them where they're lacking in security. So if that deters you, you can go ahead and walk away now. I won't be offended. Um, also, my demo, unfortunately, is not going to work. Um, you know, I think anybody that does this knows that VMs don't always cooperate. And my snort box blew up, and I was like, okay, I'll just rebuild it. Well, it didn't work out so well. So we got some slides, and then maybe we'll get out of here early and be the first to launch, right? So we'll start with uh, intro. Then we'll go into uh, why we care about security, or why we should care about security. Then we'll go into uh, what to protect the threats to the things that we're trying to protect, and then how to protect it. So a little bit about myself. Um, no, that's not my real picture. I think maybe the only thing we have in common is the belly. That'd be about it. Um, I'm married, have uh, two kids. Uh, actually, second one was born a month, month and a half ago. Um, I've been doing IT stuff for about 12 years now, concentrating on security in the last six, seven years. And like I said, I'm back to offense now. You know, it's like playing football as a kid, you know. Defense is never as fun as offense is. So I was working at a bank for a while and then made me an offer to go back to offense. So that's where I'm at now. Um, I also run the local uh, DEF CON group. Anybody familiar with DEF CON? Anybody heard of that? All right, good deal. So I run the local DEF CON group, DC612. It's a good time. Any local people should check it out. Um, all right, so reasons to care. Uh, a few reasons that we should care about security is to uh, prevent data theft, um, deter identity theft. That one's really becoming more popular. I think so far this year, last time I checked, there were about 10 million reported cases of identity theft. Now, that's just, keep in mind, that's just reported cases. There's several people out there that don't even know they're a victim of identity theft, especially some like the senior community. They don't realize it till years down the road. Like, oh, I never bought that car. Um, and then the other thing we want to do is avoid legal issues. Uh, it's timely, costs a lot of money, so avoid those. Um, that's really become a problem with uh, community banks because they usually don't have the best security. And um, most recent one was out in New Jersey. I think it was a construction company. I don't know if anybody knows what I'm talking about. They might be more familiar with than me, but they basically got hacked. The person siphoned the credentials for their online banking system and initiated a bunch of ACH transfers. Everybody know ACH transfer? It's a way to like send money electronically, fast. Um, and they actually sued the community bank saying that they didn't have adequate security in place. So it's kind of, some, some of the smaller banks are actually being targeted more now because they're viewed as an easier target. They don't have the resources that a larger financial company does. Um, but security in general is not limited to the financial community. That just happens to be what I'm most familiar with at this point. But it, it's every industry has to worry about it. And you want to protect the brand. Um, speaking of protecting brands, everybody heard of at least one of these companies, right? All of these companies up here have one thing in common. They've all been hacked this year alone. Um, I don't know if anybody's heard of like Epsilon. That was the one where they got a bunch of email addresses. Some of them I th actually thought were kind of funny. Like uh, PBS, their website said that Tupac was still alive. <laughs> Anybody see that? I thought that was kind of funny. Um, Fox News, I think, said that Obama had been assassinated, if I remember right. So, and then RSA, that one was pretty bad. Um, My sequel, that was actually a recent again. They were hacked back in March and. Last week, they're actually vulnerable to a SQL injection. Um, so headlines. Headlines are good if it's positive, but you usually don't want to end up in a headline like one of these. Um, it's bad for business. Um, bad for branding, can cause some legal issues. So these are uh, not good headlines. Um, common thing that you hear in the security community or at least that you hear when you're talking to clients, is it won't happen to us. Um, well, I'm here to tell you that's 
I was going to say bullshit, but probably shouldn't swear. It's BS. How about that? Um, it can happen to anyone. Even your little mom and pop shop, two employees, they can get hacked. It just happened to a pizza joint recently. Mom and pop shop, they were actually siphoning all their credit card data. And then once they put it back together, they realized, hey, it's this place. They went in. Sure enough, they were siphoning all their credit card data. Um, even security companies. Anybody heard of uh, Core Security? Maybe. Core Impact. Ring any bells? Probably not. Got a security tool. Um, yeah, it even happens to them. This was their, uh, a snip of their web page last Thursday. You can see it's probably not good for business. You know, if I'm a potential customer and I go to their website to learn more information and I see something like this, I might think twice about using their security tool. Um, <clears throat> pretty good ASCII art too, isn't it? So back to what to protect. Um, there's several things that you need to protect, and the first one is data. Obviously, data is important. Um, if it wasn't, why would we store it, right? Um, the other thing with data is it's hard to protect something if you don't know where it is. So that'd be a good starting point is figuring out where your data is, um, putting policies in place so users aren't storing all their documents locally, make sure they're on a server where you can protect it. Um, hardware, same thing. You know, protecting laptops is actually extremely hard to do. But you need to, same thing there, make sure you know where your hardware is, who's got access to your hardware. And then uh, intellectual property, that's really become another big one that some people are targeting. Uh, trade secrets. You know, if I'm, if I'm from, uh, Kellogg and General Mills are separate, aren't they? I think so. Well, if they're not, we're going to pretend they are. If I'm from Kellogg and I want to know what General Mills is doing, What's an easy way to find out? Hack in and steal their trade secrets, right? So intellectual property is another one that you really need to protect. And then, again, the brand. Um, so some threats to these things are default configurations. That one is extremely common. That's uh, short of missing patches. That's probably the second biggest vulnerability in environments. Um, everybody's got, you know, 60 hours of work to do in a 40-hour work week. So they get a new device, plug it in, it works, great, done, right? Um, you know, it could have, you know, default passwords on there that everybody knows. Um, all sorts of just configurations in general that people haven't taken the steps, the extra measures to secure. Uh, website defacement, like the core security one. Um, missing patches, that one's by far the biggest vulnerability to companies, um, whether it's just they don't have an adequate patch management system in place, or they're using third-party products that don't, doesn't have a good patch management solution yet. And there are companies out there like uh, Shavlik, they've got a, a patch management solution. Um, whether or not it works good, we'll leave that up to you guys. <coughs> um, DNS redirection is another one. Um, that's actually what Core is claiming happened to them. They said that somebody got into their registrar and changed the DNS records to point it somewhere else. And then uh, unused services kind of goes back to default configurations. You know, you put a, a server in there, it's got FTP enabled by default, but it's not being used. Well, if that FTP has write access, imagine what you could do with that. Um, and unauthorized use, I will go into that a little bit more. And this is by no means an exhaustive list. There are several other threats. Um, you know, you got end users. That's probably a big threat. But so going to uh, monitoring for some of this stuff. That's why you guys are here, right? Learn about how to monitor for it. Um, so why do you want to do the monitoring? Well, for one, automation. Um, I don't like doing anything manual. I don't think anybody else does here. That's why we're at the now use convention, right? Um, early detection. Um, I mean, you basically just want to detect it earlier where if core security hadn't detected, well, they were probably notified by several other customers, but if they didn't detect it early, how long would that be sitting out there? And you got to figure for every minute that it sits out there, it could potentially cause one more loss of sale or whatnot. Um, quick resolution, and again, it kind of goes with early detection. The earlier you detect it, the earlier you can resolve the issue. And um, validating the integrity, the integrity of your environment, uh, making sure there's not 
you know, a Trojan sitting on your network for three weeks obviously wouldn't be good. So default configurations. <clears throat> uh, default passwords. It's extremely common. Again, somebody puts the box in, it's got the default password, everything works, right? Why change the password? Um, change them. Pretty easy solution to that. Um, uh, another thing that we actually had a problem with at the, the bank I was working for is our core processing system was, it's provided by a third party. I mean, we managed it in-house, but anytime there was an issue with it, we had to call them. And the problem that we had there is when they come in remotely to fix it, they always wanted to change the SA account back to their default. It wasn't a blank SA account, but it was a very well-known password. Anybody that used their system knew that this was the SA account password. So the problem there is if I'm an attacker, it's pretty easy to figure out that password. I go into the bank, boom, I got access to your database. Obviously not good, right? So what we actually did is we changed the password to something that only we knew, and we set up Nagios just simply to log in to the SQL server using that password. So now the third party is in working on it, they change it back to their default, we get an alert instantaneously. The problem we had before is we calmly, hey, you know, we told you not to change this password. Oh, no, we didn't do it. Well, now, when Nagios is monitoring it, you see the minute they do it. So then you can get into the server, see who it is, call them, hey, why'd you change the password? Oh, no, we didn't do it. Really? You want to see the logs on it? Because I'm pretty sure you did. Um, so that's, that's one thing that you can do for uh, default configurations. Um, and, I mean, you could do that with, with any device, really. I mean, say it's a, a firewall. You know, you change the password, you know, monitor that, logging into that device using that password. If somebody changes that password, obviously Nagios isn't going to be able to log into that device anymore. You're going to get an alert. You look, hey, what happened? See the password changed? Then you just got to figure out who did it, right? Um, you can also use uh, Exercise Auto Discovery Check for insecure protocols. Um, anybody know what I mean when I'm saying insecure protocols? Anybody? Yeah. Stuff where the authentication is sent in clear text, um, Telnet, regular HTTP, that sort of thing. You can actually use the auto discovery and it'll run, and then you just look at that. Hey, wait a minute, why is Telnet enabled on this machine now? And then, of course, you still have to do the legwork to figure out why it got turned on or who did it, but it helps out there. And then you can also do uh, scheduled scans and output to Nagios. Um, anybody familiar with Nessus? Maybe? A couple people? All right. Um, Nessus you can actually run from the command line and there's uh, scripts out there that you can actually take that output, run a few things on it and anything that's changed can get piped into Nagios. So that's pretty handy to do, just a scheduled daily scan. Um, that was handy for us. Then uh, web, <coughs> monitoring for defacement. There's several different ways you can do this, you know there's 10 ways to skin the cat. Um, the way that we were doing it is we'd actually put a hidden string on our web page, and then if somebody's going to deface it, chances are the hidden string would not be there anymore, or at least so we were hoping. Um, so you just put like a, well, that got loud, didn't it? Um, just put a secret, you know, a hidden string in there, and yes, I purposely spelled secret wrong. Um, and then when the check runs, if it doesn't detect that anymore, it's going to throw an alert. And then you can say, hey, what happened? You go and look, and oh, look at that. Our website got defaced. Um, another thing that we found fairly handy was the uh, check certificate. Because when your certificate expires, it's not like you can just go out and say, OK, I'm ready for a new one, and you'll get one instantaneously. Um, unless it's from Komodo, I guess. Um, sorry, that was a low blow. Um, anybody who doesn't know, Komodo got hacked recently. But anyway. Um, so you do the check certificate, this one will do it for 21 days and it'll alert you, say, hey, look, the certificate's going to expire in 21 days. Usually that's enough time to contact the CA and say, hey, look, we need a new certificate. And then they validate you or should validate you and give you a new certificate. Um, the other thing you can use it for is to get alerted if you're under a distributed denial of service. That's what that fancy little four letter acronym stands for. Um, and basically there you're, you're looking for response time. If it takes 60 minutes for your web page to come up, you can look and say, hey, what's going on? And if you're under a 
DDoS attack. You get alerted there. And uh, software installed that was one of the things I was talking about earlier. Um, what we actually did is for Adobe, we realized Flash was really getting hit hard. Um, we, it, there, it seemed like every day there was a new O day out and then they'd patch it. And if we didn't have the patch installed, we're a lot more likely to get hacked. Um, hackers now, they've realized that it's a lot easier to target the end user than it is to you know, look at the web application you run on your server, reverse that, look for vulnerabilities there and exploit that. It's a lot easier to just send something to an end user you know, that says, hey, you want a trip to the Caribbean, click on this link to give us your information, whatever it is. And then they click on the link if they're using Flash, like that Flash. Um, then they, if they had a vulnerable version of Flash installed, exploited, boom, game over. So what we did is we'd actually go to that link, and this may have changed. Like I said, I haven't done this in a little while. But we'd actually check for the string of the version that's out there. So now if Adobe comes out with an update, when this check goes out there, it's not going to see that version anymore. So then a uh, Nagios alert is generated, and you look, oh, look at that. Adobe's updated their version of Flash, or changed their website. But um, And then, obviously, that does require a little bit of manual work, because then you have to go in and change your check for the new version. But it's pretty simple, right? And the last bullet point there, is there anybody else using this in a better way than that? Really curious. Is that really the only way to check for software stuff, maybe? Yeah? Um, well, this is not a Nagia solution. It's an uh, external software you install in Windows. It's called PSI, Personal Security Inspector, and it checks uh, on a daily basis or whatever you define what your software version is against these URLs, and it can uh, update it automatically if you yeah. want. Yeah, I've seen that in like open audit, similar thing. But the problem we had is, again, that requires manual, you know, it's one more thing to look at every day. And that's why we're trying to tie everything into Naga, so it's just, it's automatic. It's going to alert us. So, yeah, it's good though. Um, DNS. One of the things you want to look for is have DNS entries changed. If your DNS entry for your website changed, did you change it? No. Well, then chances are a malicious attacker changed it for you. Um, DNS gets hijacked, and that's obviously got a high impact. Um, depending on what they're redirecting in DNS, I mean, they could just be redirecting your mail. We actually saw that when I was doing consulting back in, I think it was 2004. Um, that was actually an issue that we had. They had just changed their MX record, and they were actually collecting all their mail and then forwarding on just the stuff that they didn't want that company or that they did want the company to get. But basically they were filtering this company's mail. You know, they're like, hey look, how come I'm getting all these notifications to my personal email account? I signed up in my e company email address. How come those aren't coming in? And after I mean it, it took a, a little bit of work to figure it out, but that's what had happened is they, they simply changed their MX record and they're basically filtering all the mail that was going to this company. Um, unused services, we talked about that a little bit. You can use auto discovery and uh, check for insecure services. And the other thing to do is uh, check for previously disabled services. Um, you know, again, like Telnet, you know, actually the, th the problem we had is we had Telnet disabled on all of our switches. And using the, the check for that, we actually determined that we had, I think it was a system that maybe it was a consultant had gone back in and decided to re-enable Telnet because that's how we, had, anybody ever heard of Tripwire? Yeah, we're using that and instead of reconfiguring Tripwire to use SSH, they figured it'd just be easier to have the switches use Telnet, right? So it's another uh, check that came in handy there. I promise we weren't just trying to cause confrontation at the company I was at. It was with good cause. Um, unauthorized use. LDAP, um, commonly if an attacker does get into your environment, they're going to create their own account. And obviously an LDAP check, uh, you can determine, hey, this user account was created. 
and then you tie it back to you know the HR was there a new user with that name that came on if not again you got to go back and check it but and then you can also you know th that's good in also identifying a rogue admin um, that's actually I don't know how much I can say about that but it worked in identifying an admin that was creating backdoor accounts um, and then syslog output and uh, snort um, the syslog you can do that from from any device you know your switches firewalls and then all that will alert to Nagios and the one that came in handy for us was snort um, I don't know how many people have used snort but we found that you know the emails really tended to be more than we wanted and we wanted the central thing tying it back to Nagios so we actually sent all the snort alerts to Nagios and that was what I was going to demonstrate until my VM decided not to work great. And then uh, other uses, there's several plugins out there. Um, one of them that I thought was pretty cool, you know, I, I was going to use the joke that here's my wife looking for dinner, but now that she's actually here, I probably shouldn't use that joke. <laughs> um, but one of the one of the uses I saw, it, it'll actually, that's a person dumpster diving, by the way. I don't know if anybody's heard of dumpster diving. It's really not a lot of fun. But that's how people get sensitive information because companies, it's amazing what companies will throw in the trash versus shredding. Um, passwords, IP addresses, employee lists, those are all good for an attacker. Um, but the one that I saw, it, it monitors a video camera and if it detects motion, it'll actually generate an IUS alert. So you could use that something like on your dumpsters. I mean, really, your dumpster probably doesn't get a lot of use during the day, at least at a smaller company. It doesn't get a lot of use during the day. So if you've got a camera on and you say, you know, well, obviously the cleaner is there from 11 to 1 in the morning, so it's just not alert during those times. But any other time, we should be alerted. Um, so that was another use. Anybody else have any other ideas? No? How about questions? No ideas, no questions? Everybody's hung over, aren't they? <laughs> oh, hold on. We gotta get the mic. There was a face recognition, uh, face recognition uh, plugin. I haven't tried it out yet, but it's out there on the exchange. Have you had a chance to play with it? You no, know, I haven't. I haven't even seen that one. Yeah, it's pretty cool. They, they give, you could put it like in front of a server room, so when they come in, you swipe the card and it, it'll detect the face structure or whatnot if it's an authorized person. They'll so does it have like a database of like, here's the authorized people? So if I come in with like yeah. a Guy Fox mask on, it's gonna be like, hey. Yeah, I'm not sure. Not good. <laughs> I'm not sure, but it's on the exchange. All right. So I don't know, I'll tell you guys what it is. Yeah, no, I'll have to check that out. Huh. Anybody else? Everybody's just hungry for lunch now, aren't they? Trying to eat the hangover away. All right, well, that's all I had. So, sorry for the demo not working, but thanks for coming.